So today we're continuing the sermon series, Living It Out. And this month we're taking three sermons to look at how we live out our discipleship through learning and caring. And learning and caring is a vast area to cover in just three sermons, but we're giving it a go. And uh, last week we were challenged by Lewis uh, to follow Christ by practicing radical hospitality and incredible generosity. Next week we're going to be thinking about what it really means for us to exercise childlike, uh, Christ-like care. Uh, how do we care like Jesus Christ cares? But this week we're focusing upon uh, how we're called to live out our discipleship by being constantly ready and open to learn. To state the blatantly obvious, discipleship is all about learning. The context of the early followers of Jesus was this. Jesus was a Jewish teacher. He was a rabbi. He had Jewish disciples. And they were living in a first century Jewish context. Jesus grew uh, and and became an adult in the region of Galilee. And he lived among people who believed that generations before, God had spoken to a man called Moses, through whom had been given what we now know as the first five books of the Bible, sometimes called the Pentateuch, but often uh, referred to as the Torah. The word Torah means teaching. It means instruction. But it was sometimes referred to simply as the way. I gather from those in the know that this is much like the Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. Um, <laughs> the Torah was the foundation upon which the Jewish people sought to base their lives. It was the focus of their educational system. There is no getting away from the fact that in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, formal schooling was heavily skewed to benefit boys. The girls just received sort of a trickle-down education in the home. Between the ages of six and about ten, most boys would initially learn the Torah from a teacher in their local synagogue. It was normal for boys of 10 to have memorized the whole of the Torah by heart. That's the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. A phenomenal feat. At 10 years old, most of these boys would then cease their Torah education and start work, usually in their family business. But for the best of the best, they were invited to continue studying and for a further four or five years they would memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures Joshua through to Malachi an even bigger feat of memory by 15 most of these had also started to work but the best of the best of the best they were encouraged to continue and they did that by approaching the rabbi of their choice and applying to become that rabbi's disciples. And being a disciple was something far deeper than just a student attending school and learning stuff academically. It was not just about knowing what your teacher knows. A disciple wants to live as their rabbi lives. A disciple seeks to do things in just the same way as their rabbi does things. They were living out as their rabbi lived out what they believed. And the really important thing to note here is that rabbis differed in their interpretation of the Torah. 
Different rabbis had different sets of interpretations, but how you uh, understand and how you interpret and how you then live out what's written in the scriptures would vary from rabbi to rabbi. Sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes in quite significant ways. And the set of interpretations that a particular rabbi taught was called that rabbi's yoke. It was the burden of teaching they were placing on the students, the, the disciples who followed them. And if after getting to know a boy for a while, the rabbi thought that he had what it took to continue as his disciple, as a faithful follower, then the rabbi would choose him by saying, follow me. The wise people of the day would say of a new disciple, after the rabbi had said, follow me, and they had said yes, and left everything to follow. Wise people of the day would say to those, those disciples, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, may you follow your rabbi so closely that you end up caked in the dust kicked up from the feet of your rabbi as you walk together through the dusty Middle East. This is the, the context of the words of Jesus recorded in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, verse 30, where he says this, Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And the really important thing to note here is that in talking about his yoke, Jesus is referring to the particular way that he interprets the laws of God, the scriptures. The New Testament speaks of many other rabbis and teachers of the law who were constantly arguing with each other and with Jesus about the correct way to interpret this or that text. The correct thing to do to live out faithfully what the text said. And then uh, along comes Jesus and really, I mean, he blew a lot of their minds reading the Gospels because he seemed to be a rabbi who was breaking all the rules of how this is done or how it's always been done. Perhaps most notably, Jesus did not wait for the best of the best of the best to come and knock on his door and say, can I be your disciple? Jesus went up to those who were not especially brilliant. He went to those who had already left their studies because they weren't the best of the best of the best. They were, they were in work. They'd given up their studies. They were in often the family business. And Jesus went up to them, these also rans, and said to them, follow me. Jesus initially went up to 12 ordinary working men and basically said, you are capable of bearing the weight of the way I interpret the Torah. I believe you can become like me. Follow me. So Jesus begins his movement by making a following of ordinary men believing they can live out their discipleship in extraordinary ways. But very soon after he began, Jesus was in other ways soon going against the social norms of the culture of his place and time. Most strikingly, the gospel accounts contain clear evidence that he began to teach not only men, but women. John chapter 4, 
contains a lengthy conversation between Jesus and not just a woman, a Samaritan woman. And their conversation, you can read it in John chapter 4, is really quite significant conversation around the theology of worship. Towards the end of Luke chapter 10, when a woman called Martha complains to Jesus about the fact that her sister is listening to Jesus' teaching rather than helping with the housework, Jesus says to Martha, Mary, your sister, has chosen what is better, and I will not take it away from her. Flying in the face of all kinds of social norms, very soon Jesus' followers expanded to include not only men but women. Not only rich but poor, not only free people but slaves, not only educated but uneducated, not only Jews but Gentiles, outcasts, sinners, none of whom would have been thought of in their day as the best of anything, necessarily. By following Jesus, the not-so-good-enoughs of every kind began to change the course of human history. Jesus does this in every generation. Jesus is still doing it today. Jesus is calling you and calling me to learn his way of interpreting the scriptures and then to practice living out that way. Jesus calls us because he believes that we are capable with his help of, of doing that. Of being covered in his dust as we seek to pay attention to where Jesus is going, to what Jesus is doing, to how Jesus is behaving. And then we try to go the same way as Jesus, to do the same things as Jesus, to behave as we believe Jesus would behave. Following Jesus is not just about the big choices we some have, times have to make. It's more often not about the countless tiny, small decisions we make every day of our lives. Small decisions that actually end up affecting the course of our lives, who we are. Working our way each day through the to-do lists, the tasks, the interactions, the relationships. To become a, a Christian, to be a disciple of Christ, which is what a Christian is, is to commit to a lifelong apprenticeship to learning from Jesus and doing life the Jesus way. So how in practical terms... That's all very well. How do we go about all of that in 21st century world, where it's happened and all, wherever you are? First thing, first, uh, recognize that being a disciple is not an academic and theoretical exercise. Being a disciple of Christ involves being in a living relationship with Jesus Christ. We're in Easter. He is risen. By his spirit, he is with us. And that should shape everything we do, that we're in relationship with a living saviour. By the spirit of God, as you open up your heart and your mind and your life to learn from Jesus, Jesus is walking and talking with you. Secondly, by far the best way of ensuring that we are truly grounding ourselves in the way that Jesus interpreted things is to read and then to keep on rereading the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and teaching. And if you've, you've never done this before, don't be intimidated. You don't have to start, in fact, don't start at Genesis and work your way through uh, 
Choose one of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you can't find them in the Bible, look in the contents page at the beginning. Don't be embarrassed. Find the page and go to them. Make time to read for yourself what Jesus says and does. If you have plenty of time, read large chunks. You can read Mark's Gospel uh, in quite a short space of time. But if not, just work through smaller, bite-sized pieces. Quality is better than quantity. Thirdly, if you don't understand a particular passage, then look up a few Bible commentaries. See what different scholars have to say about the text that confuses you. And uh, here at High Street, if you happen to be able to get to, to the building physically, we have in that corner of the building uh, a resource centre which we continually replenish and stock with all sorts of books, including commentaries on the scriptural texts, which you are welcome to come and read, to borrow, uh, and make, make use of. Um, Fourthly, if you have not already done so, I really do recommend get an overview of the Bible as a whole by attending uh, our next Bible course. Or if you're elsewhere in the world and can't get to our Bible course, find a local church in your area which is running a Bible course, six, six weeks uh, uh, course. That's not full time, literally it's a it's an hour or two uh, for six weeks and you learn about the whole of the Bible, an overview. Really helpful. And then fifthly, don't study alone. Jesus calls different people to be disciples together. We all see things from different points of view and this is a really good thing because we most likely see things most completely when we're listening to each other's perspectives. When we look at them together, we see things in the whole, and that's really helpful. So consider joining a home group. And if you are interested in joining a home group and want to know more, then do uh, contact the church office uh, during the week um, and, and let us know and we'll sort that out for you. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for calling us to learn from your son, Jesus Christ, and to follow in his way. Thank you for choosing us, not because we are the right type of person, but because you believe that with your help, we can faithfully live out our discipleship to Christ. We're sorry where we have ignored your call to follow. We're sorry where we have doubted your belief in our ability to do it. Please help us to follow Jesus more closely. Please help us to keep on learning from Jesus. Please fill us with your spirit the same spirit that filled Jesus Christ, that raised him from the dead, that we may become more like him in every way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.